Welcome to Wildlife World Photographers channel. I'm Yetmi from Albania and in today's talk we will uh, explore diverse perspectives shared by wildlife photographers coming from different parts of the world. Allow me to briefly introduce them, uh, uh, including what they are going to discuss today. I'd like to introduce Joe coming from USA who will be talking about behavioral shots. Uh, William from Scotland we will be talking about action shots, shots in flight. Uh, Panayotis from Greece, who will be talking essentially about uh, macro photography. We had two more wildlife photographers who could not join due to last minute personal reasons. Uh, this happens uh, just like uh, we can control nature when out photographing. We also can control unforeseen events that prevent us from doing what we like at times. In any case, uh, we wish our colleagues well and hope to have them on our show next time. Moving forward, uh, during the Zoom call, uh, each of our wildlife photographers will have a five minute turn to discuss where they are based and share tips, tricks, and interesting perspectives related to their topic of conversation. Uh, this is a great opportunity for viewers to uh, learn from our presenters, uh, foster a sense of uh, community, and potentially gain new uh, insight and inspiration. Without further ado, let's begin with our first presenter. Uh, Joe, please uh, briefly tell us uh, where you're based in U.S. and share with us all you have planned regarding behavioral shots. Uh, by the way, uh, you have sent me a few pictures of the snowy owl, uh, so feel free to begin as I open the first image. Hmm. Just waiting for your image, Yatmir. Go ahead, go ahead, Joe. You can go ahead. Yeah, you can go okay. ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Yatmir, for inviting me into your world wildlife talk. Um, I'm to be here along with the other photographers. Uh, I'm based in New Jersey, near the New Jersey shoreline, uh, with quick and easy access to the New Jersey beaches. Um, I thought today might be a good, um, a good time to talk about uh, snowy owl behavior, not so much behavior of them being um, what they do, but how they arrive here. Mm. So every year come November, we get snowy owls that visit the New Jersey shore, the New York City area, Long Island, and so forth. Uh, but what brings the snowy owls down to this area is what's called an eruption. Um, for people that aren't familiar with a snowy owl eruption, uh, it basically happens when there is a large uh, production of lemming in the Arctic when the lemming have a large production year, which happens roughly every four years, the snowy owl babies, uh, more of the group will survive. The snowy owls can lay anywhere from what I've read, I've never seen it, but anywhere from six to 10 eggs. During a lemming eruption, which comes early in the year, late winter, early spring, if there is plenty of food for the snowy owl babies to survive, more juveniles of the clutch of the 10, maybe as many as all of them, would survive. Come September, October, those juvenile snowy owls, along with adults, not as many adults, but more juveniles, travel south in search of food. It's kind of a known thing. It's every four years, but it could happen in three years as it did a couple of years ago. It came a year early. Sometimes it can be five years. Um, so here I have an image that you're showing. This is uh, an image going back to uh, 2017 of a snowy owl resting on the beach in the snow. It's an image I always wanted to capture. I just waited for a cold snowy day to trek down to the beach did a lot of walking this day, which kind of brings me to the next point. Here in New Jersey, you just don't know where the birds are gonna be. Where will they be on the beach in the dunes? There are a few areas, one is an eight and a half mile beach, uh, which you can access in many, many spots, but you still can be out there for many hours, not finding them. You have to be in good shape to trek the beaches, uh, especially in the dead of winter. 
And I would say nine out of 10 times, you're going to come up empty handed. Mm -hmm. There is another beach that's further south that once you park, you have no option but to walk approximately four miles down to the tip of the barrier island. There you can normally find a snowy owl or two. But again, in the dead of winter, that's a tough walk. So that leads me to what I wanted to tell you is that I've kind of battled that situation of doing all that walking. I became handicapped about five years ago. I had major neck surgery. And I feel, well, how am I going to be able to handle photographing snowy owls if I can't walk the beaches? Just decided I'd go out and get my beach pass and a four by four vehicle. Now I just ride the beaches in my vehicle, staying nice and warm, windows open as to not create any heat shimmer. Um, and I photograph the birds basically right from my vehicle. They don't seem to mind vehicles as you're pulling up. Um, I would say that if you got out of the car, you'd be a lot more uh, out in the open, but they don't seem to mind the vehicle. So I try to do most of my photography of the snowies from the vehicles. If you want to go to the next image, um, yeah, Mira, I can tell you. So not that this is a world-class image or anything like that, but this is down at one of the beaches where this snowy owl was resting on this boardwalk. So I'm facing northeast at this point, and the wind is coming out of the south. So just prior to the shot, so this is going towards the behavioral thing and how you can be prepared to not only photograph snowy owls and raptors, all large birds will take off into the wind. It helps them get up into the air. So this bird was actually facing away from me, but with, with the wind at my back, I knew as the day progressed and it was time for him to go out hunting, he would eventually turn my way and leap to the sky. And if you show the next image, it's probably two or three frames into it. Um, this is one of my favorite images, although I don't really love blue sky backgrounds. Uh, it was just rewarding that I sat there for three or four hours waiting for this bird to take off with and had to have my patience while doing that. Um, so uh, if you want to go to the next image, we can maybe talk something about this. So here's another one. This is early in the morning. Best time to photograph snowy owls is the first hour of the day, whether it be 15 minutes before sunrise to about 30 to an, 30 minutes to an hour after sunrise. There are their eyes are normally open. Um, they're normally, you know, checking the surroundings. They might have spent the whole night out hunting. Here I'm standing about 50 feet from the Atlantic Ocean with the snowy owl resting on top of a dune with the setting moon in the background. And as you can see, he's just perched there up on top of the dune. His eyes are wide open. Keeping my distance of roughly 100 to 150 feet. Which brings me to the next topic of your, uh, your proximity to snowy owls. Mm. Some of them will tolerate you up to maybe 50 to 100 feet, but some of them, you could be a thousand feet from them and they'll see you coming and they'll want no part of it and they'll fly off. Making them fly off is a very interesting topic. It causes a few problems. One of them is you're tiring out the bird. If you continually get close to him without knowing the damage that you're doing, um, you could tire the bird out so much so that when it's time for him to go hunt, he's just too tired to go on a hunt and eat. And these birds come thousands and thousands of miles down from the Arctic. Um, with that being said, it's always best to keep your distance, approach slowly. Once the bird shows that he knows you're there, you're probably at a point where you should just stop. Um, if you want to go to the next image now, yet, Mira, we can. So I included this image, although it doesn't really look very sharp on my screen. I don't know. Maybe I didn't send it to you in the right format. It is, it is sharp. It is sharp. It's sharp. It looks sharp, yeah. Peter. It does look good. Okay. So this is an instance that I was saying, talking about the time of day to photograph them. During the day, the birds do really nothing. They just lay in the dunes, close their eyes. They have a little slit looking out of their eyes to see if there's any predators in the area. 
Um, and for the most part, they'll sit there for eight or 10 hours doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So this particular morning, I got to the beach in my four by four, drove to that very south point and found him in this beautiful location or her. It's hard to tell because when they're juveniles, you don't know if they're male or female. The sex is very difficult to determine at this age, okay? But this bird later on moved off and hid behind some roots, some old uh, tree snags along the beach. And my friend and I were sitting in the car. I had my window down, a beanbag up. My friend was behind me with his beanbag on his window. And we sat there for, I'd say about 90 minutes. It was a very ugly shot. The bird was sitting behind, like I said, these roots. There was nothing nice about it. It was backlit. The sun was starting to get up in the sky. And if you go, I think, to my last image, um, I wanted to show this one because while we were sitting there, my friend and I were chatting in the car, I noticed just out of the corner of my eye, the bird's head and neck stretched out raised up high, the eyes opened wide, and he was looking all around, looking to my right, to my left, over, over my vehicle. So I said to my friend, I said, keep an eye out because something's going on. And all of a sudden the bird left. Um, this is an image about three or four images after it actually pushed off the sand because I didn't really like the roots in the image. But this bird flew directly at me and I still had no idea at this point what it was. Sure enough, he flew right over my vehicle. I turned my neck. I looked up the beach, and he was chasing a peregrine falcon. Oh, wow. Um, never <laughs> caught the falcon. Uh, never would catch the falcon. And I'm not sure who would win that battle. But it was just uh, very interesting. So if you do happen to come across a snowy owl in the middle of the day, don't expect to be doing too much. But if you see those eyes open up, be prepared. Something good's going to happen. Very nice. Thank you so much, Joe. Okay. By the way, yeah, by the way, by uh, you discussing the behavioral perspectives of the snowy owl, owl we were introduced also with the challenges uh, one has uh, in wildlife photography and also having a sense of responsibility with respect to not uh, bothering wildlife, extremely important, being cautious with the distances. It's a very sensitive topic here. Sure. Because we don't right, see please. birds often, and when they do arrive, uh, just there's just there are a lot of respectful photographers, but there's just there is always that handful or that one or two that sure. have to have the image that they've seen on social media, and they feel the only way they're going to get it is to force the animal to fly or the bird to fly. And then another thing that I would like to touch upon here, since that I photograph in the United States and Europe and also other places, uh, something that I found that it's unique and different, US versus Europe. Uh, I think what, what they're doing in, Euro in Europe, so they do not bother the birds and the wildlife we photo uh, that we photograph is that they often create um, hides. Uh, they, are, they have experience into making sure that even if the pho when photographing happens, the wildlife, it's not bothered. In US, you do not have the experience of height. So you really need to have the right equipment, the right lenses, the long lenses, the right distances, the right knowledge, which is extremely important. That's why discussing with birders, learning from them, uh, reading books, having these conversations that we're having now are also educational, I believe, on how we should approach wildlife. Uh, but really it just, it just made me think about the differences uh, photographically. Absolutely. It's, it's very sad. And I do use, I do use um, blinds, um, mostly when I'm photographing fox. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a lot of red fox in the area, and there are some instances where I will set up a blind uh, or a hide and just photograph from there. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much, Joe. We'll Welcome. jump, uh, well, I'd like to invite uh, Panayotis from Greece uh, to please uh, tell us a little bit more about himself. And okay. uh, as I start opening his images that he sent, go ahead, uh, Panayotis. Hello, uh, my name is Panayotis. I'm a, a 
macro photographer from Greece, uh, mostly interested in uh, nature macro photography, more specifically uh, insects, uh, arthropods, uh, flowers, mushrooms, etc. I'm currently based in uh, Athens. I recently moved here from uh, my home place in uh, in a village near Kozani, which is in uh, northern Greece. Uh, so macro photography for me is a very uh, how can I say it? It's a very intricate uh, topic in photography because there are many different approaches, some of which are more uh, science oriented and some uh, which are more art oriented. I'm trying to to adjust my style to the more artistic part of the of the genre, but uh, it's not always easy. And uh, of course, I do not uh, judge uh, negatively the people who who try the scientific approach because uh, of course uh, there are many discoveries of uh, new species happening every day because of uh, photographers and I think this is uh, something uh, very important uh, so now what is uh, what's a good way to approach macro photography uh, I think that because uh, you're all uh, birders here uh, or big animal shooters if I if I can uh, tell uh, the main thing is that uh, in macro photography, even uh, during the middle of the day, you're in control of the light. Because, uh, for example, if you shoot a, a big animal during uh, uh, the noon with uh, harsh uh, sunlight, the photo is probably gonna uh, not going to look uh, that good. But in macro photography, you just have to to carry with you a, a diffusion umbrella, and then you can control. You can have soft light in the middle of the day, no trouble. And I mostly prefer to use a natural light with some diffusers and some uh, reflectors in my photography. Uh, a few times I will use a flash if, uh, if I want a special effect that I cannot achieve uh, with the natural light. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's fine either way, whatever works uh, for every person. So I also I would also like to discuss the the ethics uh, topic because in macro photography I think it's even more. Uh, uh, it's even a more hot topic because uh, people uh, can relate to bigger animals and they because uh, they have facial expressions and uh, you can somehow tell for example if a fox feels hurt or uh, if a mammal feels hurt but you cannot tell if an insect or if a spider feels uh, pain or, or fear or anything so I think it's important to to approach these subjects with respect, uh, even though we cannot relate as much to them. And uh, I have seen many, many unethical practices, for example, even uh, killing subjects and uh, framing them uh, as if they were alive uh, with strings, etc., or freezing them uh, in, in the freezer and, uh, mm -hmm. just because you want to, to take closer shots. And uh, I personally like, uh, and I think, this is also the essence of wildlife photography, to, to be out in nature, to feel in touch with nature, because uh, after all, we, we are part of nature. And if, uh, if for example, uh, the pollinators uh, stopped existing, then it won't be long after we stopped existing as uh, humans. So anyway, let's uh, talk more about uh, the, ph the photographic uh, part now. Uh, in this image, uh, we see a, a crab spider, Tomisus sonustus is uh, its scientific name. Uh, this spider has uh, some uh, special abilities. It, it can change, it can adjust its color to match the flower it's uh, sitting on. It, it cannot take uh, all colors uh, and it doesn't uh, switch as much, uh, as fast as a chameleon would do. It uh, takes a couple of days. And uh, this is its main, uh, uh, it's my praying technique and uh, there are studies which uh, show that uh, bees are more likely to visit flowers with the crab spiders on them than not because uh, I don't know something uh, they, they appear more uh, appealing in the uh, ultraviolet spectrum where bees can see uh, for this image I used the uh, natural light it was a, a cloudy day so I didn't have to use any diffuser or something uh, I used uh, a pretty shallow depth of field because I wanted to have uh, enough light uh, 
because I do not want to raise my ISO too high, because in macro photography you lose a lot of detail if you if you raise uh, the ISO too high, and uh, my gear is pretty old, so it's uh, it's more troublesome than uh, if I had a new newer gear, and I have stacked I think. Uh, about 20 photos. I do not recall exactly the number of stacked images I used. Uh, let's move to the next image, if you'd like. So this is one of my favorite images. I took it uh, last September. This image is actually taken uh, during uh, the middle of the day. I was, uh, I was in the forest where I, I frequently hike uh, for microphotography. And I spotted this, uh, this mantis religiosa next to, to this mushroom. Uh, the light on the back is actually the sun, which is coming through some uh, trees uh, that were in the forest. I placed my camera in a low, in a low angle because I I kind of drew inspiration from the from its scientific name, which is Mantis religiosa, and the, I wanted uh, somehow to make it like the old religious paintings where there are halos around the the saint's head. Uh, Let's move on to the next image, if you like. Uh, so these bees, uh, are, I found them uh, on a mountain where I I did not use, I did not uh, visit too frequently, but I go there because there are some rare butterflies uh, on this mountain, and I also I'm also a volunteer in butterfly conservation. So anyway, as I was leaving this place, I spotted uh, these bees uh, sleeping on uh, on this branch, and it was my first time seeing so many on a single branch. Uh, this is also uh, a natural light image, and I I did stack about five to six images, I think. Uh, let me talk a bit about focus tagging. What is focus tagging? Uh, you basically uh, adjust uh, your your gear to focus to a different uh, part of the image uh, in each shot. And then uh, in the post-processing, you you stack all these images so that you can have a, a wider area in focus, which is a common practice used in uh, micro photography. Uh, let's move on, if you'd like. Uh, this is a quite recent image, I think uh, less than a month old. Uh, I still haven't found many places here in Athens where I where I can uh, safely say that I will go there and I will for sure find something interesting to shoot. So in this image, I, I like that uh, the mantis is sitting on a branch which has uh, three smaller branches uh, coming out, and then on the left bottom uh, side of the image, there are also uh, there's also a similar branch, and uh, it kind of creates a a pattern in uh, the image. Uh, for me, this is uh, the way I I usually try to approach images. I I'm trying to to also look what's on my background, what's on the area that uh, my subject is not uh, located, and if and if I can create something like a pattern or uh, some area with uh, some special lighting uh, around my subject. Uh, and uh, do I have a, I think one more, or is this the last image? Yeah, this ah, this yeah. is the last one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one. So yeah, this uh, one is also a pretty recent image. I also took it uh, at the same place I found the, the previous mantis. So dragonflies, I they're a bit special to me, you know, uh, because I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they are the most efficient uh, Predators in the animal kingdom. I think they have like a ninety-seven percent uh, success rate during hunting, and uh, because uh, Joe was talking about behaviors uh, before, let me talk about a bit about the dragonfly's behavior. If uh, dragonflies find a branch that they really like, they will uh, they will visit the same branch multiple times. For example. Uh, when I approached this uh, dragonfly, uh, I, I scared it at first, but then I, I placed my camera on the ground right uh, next to this branch. I waited for about uh, a minute or so, and it returned to to the branch. Then when I when I tried to to place my hand on the camera to press the shutter, it also it flew again, and then it uh, returned again, and uh, then I could uh, take uh, my shot. 
I think that's it. I don't know if you if you have any questions uh, you'd like to ask me. Uh, by the Could way, you deliberately place the camera in that position to get the foreground, or was that just because you couldn't get the whole subject in the clear? Uh, could you repeat? Sorry, you maybe not have my accent. You know that last photograph? Yes, yes. Position the, the camera on the ground. Yes. Did you mean to collect the foreground in the in the frame, or was there a position you could have put it so you could see the whole of the dragonfly? No, Without I like uh, I like having something uh, between yeah. my lens and my subject. Yeah, I understand because, that. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. That's what I thought. yeah. It, it gives a sense of depth, which in macro photography I think it's a bit harder than uh, because uh, you you have a, uh, such a small area to work with. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Uh, this is you. You gave us a, a sneak peek of this rich world of macro photography. Uh, importance of ethics uh, within this uh, photography. You shared some tips, tricks, and some styles. Appreciate that very much. And, that, and now, without further ado, I, I invite uh, William, uh, our good friend here, who loves to take uh, shots in flight. So I'll. Uh, and he'll tell us where he's based, and then I'll I'll go ahead and open the first image and take it from there. Go ahead, William. Hi guys, I'm from Scotland, uh, County of Fife, or the Kingdom of Fife, as to say, on the east coast. Regarding the flight or action photography, don't get me wrong, I really love all photography, especially flight. But I would I started off doing perched birds. And I uh, soon got bored because <laughs> I thought I, I wanted to do something more difficult to test myself. Mm. So, as everyone knows, you need a very, very fast shutter speed. The faster, the better um, for flight photography. Um, when I really got into it, I've been doing photography, bird photography now for about 20 years. And as everyone knows, the, the difference in the cameras and the difference in the denoise software has improved tremendously over the last couple of years, which has helped me a lot because the most difficult thing with flight photography is catching the, the subject in focus. There's nothing worse than looking at a photograph of a bird in flight when the wing's in focus and this head is slightly out of focus. And all the rules to all bird photography applies. You need a good flight pose, you need a good head angle, blah, blah, blah. Uh, everyone knows it looks better if you've got all that together. For instance, in this photograph, if the eye had been under the water, it would have been a delete for me. Because the eye is just entering the water, that's the attraction, that's the eye-catching part of the image. Mm. This is a Ghana. This was taken from my hometown, just on the shore, about 20 yards down the road there. Um, what can I say? Yeah, as I said, you really need a fast shutter speed. The faster, the better. And when these mirrorless cameras come out and the software for denoising, I don't think twice about using ISO 5000 to get a shutter speed of 5000. I wouldn't even think twice about that. Two or three years ago, I wouldn't go above ISO 2000. Mm -hmm. That's how easy it is now and how much helpful it is. Also, eye detection. How can you miss? <laughs> well, you can. It's not so. It's not so easy. But you, you hear me, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you go to the next image, please? Absolutely. So the gear, the gear really has a lot to do. I think when it comes to uh, yeah. shots like this, it has to do with like, uh, yeah. the, the speed a, and everything. Yes. You, always, you always need a high speed, whatever the, the weather. High, right. The, the, and we the don't have the any weather, <laughs> so you need a high, a fast shutter speed, and you need a, fa a higher. ISO to get a, a fast shutter speed. Yeah. This was F4. That was my bare lens. That's what oh, I used. Oh, wow. Okay. F4, 400 millimeter DO Mark II Canon, mm -hmm. which is very light. Another point, when you're doing bird photography, flight, stretch your arm, do a couple of exercises, because if you don't, over the years, you've got a very sore shoulder. As you're holding the, the weight of the camera and the lens for quite long periods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was 
a setup actually. There was a it was next to a small river in Scotland where some guy had placed a basin and a bucket of water four feet from a perch. So you had maybe two settings to catch the bird diving from the perch and hitting the small the, the tub of water with fish in it. Mm -hmm. Which it was good. It kept you busy. But um, yeah, you take about 50 shots to get one like that easily. And again, an electronic flash in the new cameras, you've got a faster shutter speed. Brilliant. Frames per second, 30, no problem. Next one, please. Yep. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. These are a, uh, I've been doing a lot of photography from heights recently because I've got an illness a couple of years ago and I'm still not quite recovered. So I've not got much out and about go about me yet. I'm quite sort of weak. So I, I could sit in a, a hide all day to try and get a photograph like this. That's a long tail tip. The shutter speed there was one eight thousandth of a second. Mm -hmm. um, 6.3 at ISO 2000. Very difficult to get. There is still a small amount of blur on the, the faraway wing there, even at 8,000. So there you go. Next image, please. Yep. Right. Uh, my favourite bird to photograph in flight, the red kite. Uh, in Scotland, we have um, red kite feeding stations. There's two near to me where you can stand and defeat the birds the same time every day on raw meat, usually roadkill. So you can get 50 or 60 red kites coming in to feed. And as you can just imagine, it's a fantastic day getting flight shots of red kites and the amount of different poses you get because they're beautiful flyers, just like giant swallows. Yeah, it's, it was some day when we got that, that lot. Again, fast shutter speed, F4 again on the lens, no problem. That's cropped about 50%. And like I think it was Joe that mentioned it, I don't like a pale blue or a dark blue or just a blue sky. I like to see a bit of cloud in the sky. It always gives the bird a bit of depth on the on the frame. But the wing position makes it. Yeah, yeah. As I said earlier, the head angle, you've got eye contact, the pose, everything's there. It's probably too tight in the frame. That was that was the same with my snowy owl image. It was the wing position and the eye contact. Yeah, it makes a big difference, Joe. A really big difference. Now I go to the next one, Gemma. And the next image, I wanted just to say that it's a signature image from William. <laughs> it's, it's one of those that I truly love. I hope you guys feel the same. Yeah, it's a very oh, yeah. nice duo. <laughs> it's very rare to get two birds like that yes. banking together. Getting yeah. one is amazing because you get this, the, the dorsal view. Yeah, but to get two together, that got to the, I think it was, I put that into a competition, the bird photographer of the year, the BBC one. Mm. And it got to the sort of semi-final area so I wasn't too I was very happy with that I never thought I would get that but that's one of the only competitions I've entered for some reason so I was quite happy with that yeah f5.6 I had my converter on there my 1.4 so that gave me 560 millimeter um to get a shutter speed I think it was 1000 3, uh, sorry 1 3200 per second which pretty much froze them yeah, it's okay, yeah. Five pound gets you a, a full day at the Red Kite feeding station. How far, you how far are you? How far are you from the subject here, William? Oh, maybe the shortest you could be is maybe 20, 20 meters. Okay. Yeah. 20 yards. Yeah. So you're quite close. Yep. And go out and put the feed on a table, raw meat. The last time it was venison they used, roadkill. And uh, two o'clock every day, they come in. Six to the last time I counted. And they'll usually last about two hours. Then they'll hang about for maybe an hour or so. So you can stand here for quite a few hours and get a nice photographs. That's the adult in the front, the juvenile behind. You see it's slightly smaller. Yeah. 
Yeah, Mia, can I say something? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. What I wanted to say, William, is I'm going to have to start getting a little more creative with my bird photography because between the bucket with the fish and the roadkill meat, you're giving me some good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You would never get them either way. The kingfish would be difficult to get naturally. I have got it naturally, but as you see, the bucket with the fish attracts them. Plus, you're free feeding them. May have to come visit you. Oh, no problems. <laughs> uh, Absolutely, yeah. So that's about it, Jay Mayor. All I can say is your fast shutter speed, and you'll yeah. do it. It's got to be the fast shutter speed. And as many frames per second as you can. So you can take 200 photographs and choose the best one. Fine. Absolutely. Everything fits in. Head angle, flight pose. That's all you want. Absolutely. And you guys, and you'll end up with a sore shoulder like me. I had surgery two years ago. And uh, thank you so much, uh, William, for uh, sharing your uh, insight regarding flights in shot, uh, uh, birds in flight. And obviously, I don't know if it's my opinion or it's if it's true, but there is a lot of uh, interest raptors um, engage yes. <laughs> versus you, other birds for some reason. I think you know when you see a raptor being stopped in the ways that we saw with Joe, uh, with the snowy owl, and also yeah. your, um, and then also uh, the uh, photographing the kingfisher, which is uh, very small, by the way. But yeah, just a bit. In Europe, yeah. the kingfisher is very yeah, it's very small. It's really hard to grab. Focus mm. on it's just so you get very excited to to, to see well, you shots imagine like that. You put four feet between the water and the perch, so you've yeah. hardly got a couple of seconds to get the photograph, and you don't get any indication it's going to take off. It just goes. William, <laughs> I I, back again. William, am I right by saying that the depth of field is probably the most important thing when you're shooting kingfishers because? They move so quick and they are so small. If they're diving down from a perch and you have a close or distracting background, it probably won't work. When you've got the Correct. when you've got the separation is where it's much easier to yeah. uh, to keep attain and get sharp sharp images. Yeah, that's correct, Joe. Mm -hmm. I was lucky there because, as I said, where it was set up, there was a river behind it. Then it was greenery behind on the far side of the river. So even at F4, it just blurred it perfectly. Very nice. Ah, uh, you're welcome to come across and try it. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Very good. The so, thing uh, is, Joe, the good thing is, right, when you're doing the kingfishers, you can spend all day in the kingfisher hide, right? I'm up more interested in the kites. Listen, up to one o'clock, you leave the kingfisher hide, yeah. 10 minutes drive, and you're at the red kites. Nice. What are you doing you tomorrow? Do you do the dedication <laughs> for a couple of hours, and you go back to the kingfishers. Are you free tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it, love it. But uh, essentially, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Joe uh, Panayotis and William very much for sh sharing us the beauty of wildlife and how there are no boundaries in the beauty. And no, yeah. and, and thank you for that. And I think um, we try to have this wild talk in such a way to bring inspiration about knowledge and share the beauty within our community. So thanks everyone. Uh, we'll call it a day and very soon we'll post this live. Take care everybody. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank thanks you for having us. Thank you.